I was thinking today about October the 14th in 1994, when I was just about to get up and make a presentation at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And just before I was about to get up, I lost my nerve. And I just said, I, I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And I didn't. How unbelievably sad. Partly because what I had to say was quite important. And partly because there were 200 people there to hear it. But I lost my nerve. Presentations and making presentations is just a skill. It's a learned skill like surgery, like unicycling, like playing rugby. It's a skill. And I think probably anybody can learn it. And I think the reason I've been asked to talk to you about it tonight and the reason I do quite a lot of coaching around this is it doesn't come naturally to me. It doesn't feel comfortable. I don't love it. I don't always do brilliantly. I'm certainly not the best around. But like any good coach, it's been a struggle for me. So what we're going to do over this next 50 minutes is I videoed my presentation because why make it live when I can video it, make it reasonably polished, and then keep an eye on your questions. I'm going to stop every few minutes, ask a few questions, answer a few questions. But I don't make any live presentations virtually now because it's not necessary. Whenever you're invited to make a presentation, always ask yourself why. What's it for? It's almost always to move an audience from A to B, whether it's from ignorant to educated or indifferent to motivated or from hostile to accepting. Moving people from A to B. So why then doesn't that just happen really easily? Well, the problem is that most of the presentations we give throughout this country and even the world have got no clear point, no real end point, no point B. Most presentations have no audience benefits and for any audience to pay attention and make changes, they've got to recognise that there will be a benefit for them. Most presentations have got no clear flow. They go all round the houses but there is no clear, efficient, straight route from A to B. Most have got way too much information crammed in. It's a bit like trying to sit from a fire hose. Too much detail, too many references, too many examples. And that, of course, makes the presentation too long. If you're asked the time, you don't respond with instructions on how to build a clock, do you? So avoid data dumps. Data dumps are fine when you're preparing, but not during delivery. The working memory can only handle around seven new things. So trying to cram many, many, many things into a presentation just clobs up the working memory and usually just results in me go, mine eyes glaze over. So your presentation and the delivery of it isn't the place for a data dump. Right, let's just stop there for a minute. And let me ask you to get moving in the chat, if I may. And just as many of you as can, just start putting in there what you make your presentations for. What are they for? to share information, to teach. Now, Harry, that's interesting. You've just said information transfer. 
presentations are quite an expensive way of transferring information in this day and age. Jill, to clarify thought, whose thought, Jill? Is it our thought or is it the thoughts of the people who are listening to us? So how you're saying clinical presentations, case presentations, that kind of thing. Communication. All right, so there's loads of different reasons, but I'm still, I'm still seeing a theme here, which is about purveying information, about sharing information. And actually, we need to go a step further with our presentations, and they need to be about transformation. So, Handa, you're talking about to overview the literature. Again, that's an expensive way of using presentation time. And if we imagine people leaving us and going away better and safer, that's going to be much, much more than just purveying information. It's going to be about transformation. Right, thanks for that. I'm gonna come back to it. Just before I do though, Ben, you've said to persuade, lead towards something new. Okay, we'll go back to that, thanks. Right, let's carry on. The trick is to get your story straight, to get a very clear pathway between A and B and as straight as you can with as few steps as you can, but achieving light bulb moments where the audience just get it and are saying to themselves, oh, okay, right, I see. To do that, you're probably going to have to spend much more time on solutions rather than problems. At the moment, a lot of presentations focus mainly on problems and don't really provide enough solutions. And do make sure that at the end, there's a call to action and the audience knows what they're going to go out of the room to do. To be better and safer. Okay, so go out of the There's room. There's a myth around. Hang on a minute. Tell them what you're going to tell them. So there is a myth about how much time you spend on problems and on solutions. And probably as a general rule, what really helps me is to think about a third of the time around a problem and two thirds of the time around the solution. Okay, let's carry on. Tell them and then tell them what you've told them. Remember, you can't stamp a point into somebody's head but it is about planning. Positive planning precedes perfect performance. Start with the purpose. What's the purpose of your presentation? What's it for? I found no way better than a good old fashioned bit of paper and writing that purpose short and succinct in the middle of the piece of paper and then doing my data dump, writing down as many points notes, bits of evidence, examples, images I know I've got, put them all down on one bit of paper. That's the time for the data dump. And then you can work out the flow. You work out your end point B and start point A and the right flow between the two. You can then pull in any of the data from your dump that will help you do that and you ditch the rest of it. Then come your examples and stories and use big, powerful examples and stories. And in my dad's words, tell them how big the fire is, not where you bought the matches. Just give them enough detail to bring your example or your story alive. And only then do you consider visual aids. Now, we'll go back to visual aids after I've had a word about practice. OK, let's just um, have a word about practice. And can we ask that third question, Carlos, about there's a poll about how much practice, how much preparation you would make for a 10 minute presentation? 
Okay, I'll launch in now. Thank you. So you guys will see a poll now and uh, you need to uh, tick one of them. So about, about half of the people have voted now. Okay. I'll keep it for another few seconds. Right. That's interesting that over half would do less than five hours. And I have to admit that mm -hmm. for every minute, every minute I make a presentation, I've done an hour's preparation. So for 10 minutes, it would be at least, at least 10 hours. Thanks, that can... Uh... Uh, Lisa, I don't think they can see the result. We, we can, shall we, shall we show them what yeah, that shows? Yeah. Can, you, can you show that? Yeah, share the results. So, so now they can see it, yeah. Yeah, so it is, it's over half would do four hours or less. And only 18% only would do as much preparation as I would. Although, of course, it, re it really depends on the context. All right, let's continue. Winston Churchill, for every minute he made a presentation in public, did an hour's practice. And I usually have to do more than that. To sound spontaneous and to feel absolutely comfortable and to be able to concentrate on the audience rather than myself. So back to visual aids. A picture paints a thousand words. If we know that, why do so many of our visual aids actually turn out to be visual hindrances? Ditch as much text as you can and use images when you can. Certainly no more than five eye sweeps per slide. Don't be tempted to go for the belt and braces approach of showing an image, writing something about it on the slide and telling. Show and tell, our children have got it right. It overfaces the audience to show text and tell. Overfacing the audience gets in the way of the audience getting your message and harms learning. So, no more than five eye sweeps per slide. No more than five back and forths. And when it comes to slide rules, no more than five words per bullet or in a title. Certainly no blocks of text. And think about your font. You can see here that this bottom one is Times New Roman, which was designed for the Times newspaper to cram as many words as possible onto a page. That was really economical, but on a slide, that's not a good thing to do. What you want is for the audience to be able to get the message quickly and easily, and fonts make a big difference. Sans serif fonts further up that you can see here are the same size as this one down here, but much easier to read. Upper or lower case, which is best? Well, you can answer that question by reading this block of text yourself. As a rule, lower case text is much quicker to read than upper case text. You recognise words looking at the first and the last letter and then the shape and length of the word. Now, let's have a look at some slides. Right, let's pause now and just have a look. Have a look at the top one there. Is some, can, we bring, can we bring anybody out of obscurity, Carlos or Rupe, so that they can comment on this and work with us or does it need to be one of you? Uh. Uh, no, we can we can bring bring somebody if somebody wants to volunteer or, or Rupert always volunteers anyway. You know. Oh, does he? Poor old Rupert. No, he's apparently he's got very very damp up north. Poor <laughs> yes, he's got he's got very wet actually. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, the, we'll start with Rupert, but then it'd be good to have uh, somebody else. Somebody else put a hand up and do the next one. So, Rupert, have a look here. And what are you thinking about that top slide? 
So top slides obviously got a lot of information. Mm. Uh, it is separated by bullet points, but I think it's still going to take quite a time to absorb the mm -hmm. text and then absorb the message. Mm -hmm. Whereas I suppose uh, the the slides below uh, get the message across fairly instantaneously, don't they? Without you needing to really think or process it. Okay, so as a as a general rule, if we can drive past our bullet of our, our slide at seventy miles an hour and get the message, it's a good slide. If we can't, it's not. Remember the five eye sweeps. We've got way more than five eye sweeps there. Certainly, if you've got a bullet, you don't wrap round onto the next line. So you're really trying. If you're going to use bullets, you're really trying. I think for no more than four words. And it's amazing with a, a bit of discipline, you could always get them down. All right, anything else you can see on there that you think, mm, if I were giving some feedback to this person, anybody got anything they want to put in the chat? Any comment about how they might improve that top one? Yeah, the background distracts, good point. Uh, Catherine, what you're going for is a flat background with a high contrast font on the top of it. And you're going for high contrast. Some people say dark backgrounds, light backgrounds, less concerned about that. It's the high contrast between the background and the font that really matters. And these funny little bubbly jobbies here, what, what are those all about? They're not adding anything. And you have to ask yourself if you're making a slide, any tiny mark, anything that appears on your slide has got to be helping people learn. If it's not, get it off. Very little borders, Andrew. Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe. And the, 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 the bottom line is you can't drive past that and get the message. Now, let's be really picky. If we accept that the ones down below are better, Let's make them even better. What else could we do to make those better, the ones in the, in the bottom? Let's go to the left one first, the death by PowerPoint. What could we do to make that even more perfect? More color? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, so you think colors? doing it in colour, two lines of title, maybe, except remember eye sweeps, the fewer eye sweeps you've got, the better. Pop-up effects, I wonder whether you're talking about transitions. Now, be careful about transitions. Transition, any, any movement on a slide automatically drags the eye and takes some working memory. So be careful about that, unless it's, again, some kind of animation that helps us forward. Do you need the text? Yeah, I, I wonder whether you, we could just get rid of that completely and narrate it and say, you're seeing someone here who's been killed by bullets or death by PowerPoint. Certainly what you don't need are these quotation marks. Actually, you don't really need punctuation on slides no full stops, occasionally a comma if, you, if it uh, helps make sense, but most punctuation comes off. Death in red. Now that's interesting, uh, Emma, possibly, but red, interestingly, doesn't project well onto the back of the eye for some reason. And I don't really know why that is. And there is often some bleeding of red onto background. So I tend not to use it, but you might be all right with just one word. Right, let us move to the next slide. Is somebody willing to come out and have a, have a bash with me? Don't leave me on my own up here with, with Rupert. Rupert will need to go for a dry off in a minute anyway. I'm gonna show you to the next slide. Actually, I'm gonna animate this one, I think show you the animated version. This is a real life one, real life. I saw it, somebody I was coaching in another country, in Europe, show this slide. 
So is somebody willing to, to, to come out of obscurity? Otherwise I have to make poor old Carlos do it. Is anybody putting their hand up? Oh yes, I've got some raised hands. Who was that? Rupert? Who is it? So we've got Oladipu and somebody else had a raised hand. We'll have Oladipu. <laughs> Let's see if we can invite them there. And whilst everyone, whilst we're waiting for him to come, just have a look at that, everybody, and imagine you were giving feedback to the person who's just shown this slide. Mm -hmm. What would you say? So, Oladipupo. Oladipupo Ola, Ola, Ola has the microphone turned off, but I think L is is there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, L. Hi. Great. Far away. What would you say to the person who just shown this slide? Well, I'd be very nice to them, but this is a, this looks more like a poster that you're going to spend time looking at rather than something that's going to flash in front of you while you're giving this information. Yeah. There's, there's just too much on there. Yeah. And it looks like, I mean, there's actually six slides worth of information on, on one slide, really. Each one of those little pictures could be a slide on its own if they want to get, if they really want to show you that much pictorial information. Why do you think he's crammed it all onto one slide? Well, I, mean, I sometimes you're given a limit of how many slides you can show, and I can understand that you might want to budget to do it that way and cheese a little bit. If you haven't got a flip chart to show things or you can't do freehand drawing, um, maybe he's seen someone else do it and thought it was cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is, I mean, I've got, I'm looking at this on a, an iPad. Yeah. I can't actually see the text in the, the graphs on the right side of the screen. No, I, they're not desperately clear anyway. Okay, no. so for whatever reason, this person has crammed a load onto this slide. And sometimes that's a, a, a bit of a reflection of someone from my generation, because it cost us money to have our slides made, that we would often try and cram things in so we could reduce the number of slides. But really, as a general rule, one idea per slide, no more than that. So I think you're right, we've got too much on here crammed on, we don't know where to look. Can you see what I mean by red on black here? It's slightly bleeding in a way that the white doesn't. The blue is not high contrast enough, that's not working. The, the, um, the graphs aren't too bad in that they're not too horrendous, except that the key, if you put a key quite a long way from where the, 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 the point of the graph is, that will often uh, cause problems too. So again, go back to driving past at 70 miles an hour and getting the message, this one definitely doesn't. Less is more, no question. Right, thanks very much, Elizabeth, that's great. Who's, is somebody willing, oh, there's no flow to the slide, Joanna, you're absolutely right. There is no flow to the side and you can't, so you can't, you don't know where to start, your eyes are all over the place and then you get over face and remember drinking from that fire hose, it's too much, it's too much, so people stop. Uh, Theophilus is asking, how do you determine what is high contrast? Is there a chart somewhere? Right, well, that's, that's, a re that's a really interesting question I've not been asked before. So let me think about it, but you probably don't really need to think about it. It's just got to be either very dark background with very light text on. So black or navy, a very dark color with a, a cream or a, a, a yellow, a very pale font on the top or the other way around, a very dark font on a, uh, on a light background. I don't think it needs to be uh, any more fancy than that. Right, let's go. Somebody, somebody else put a hand up or is Aladipupo able to uh, unmute? If not, somebody else help me out. I'm gonna show you where the next slide is. 
Oh, I'm going to animate it as well. Look. Okay. What are we going to do with that one then to make it better? Somebody put, put a hand up and join me so I'm not on my own here. It is a bit nerve wracking being on your own. Someone coming to help me. See that look, begging look on my face there. Oh, look, we've got some raised hands. Great. I just can't see them. Rupert, can you help us out? Yeah, I'm just going to add. Okay, Gregor is there. Gregor. Yeah. He's happy to talk. Yeah, good evening. Uh, the, the first thing is there is no message on that slide. And there is no title, so we don't know what what the what the slide is about and what the comment of no is directed to. Well, I think, and the thing is, you'd know better than me because this was done on a hand course. I think if we look underneath the no, I think we might see what that was about. Is there something there? Think it was underneath the no but Gregor you might you anyway we don't know what this is about so it definitely needs narrating doesn't it and somebody will need to say something about it but let's look at just the visual image at uh, Gregor's what what are we going to do to make this better just as a visual well visually <clears throat> firstly I would um, edit the, the pictures and make it in uh, black and white only I'm not sure if it is done here secondly i would remove all the allocation like left right and numbers yeah. and on that dates because what you are focusing on is is probably the pathology that is being discussed so just focus on one thing on one slide yeah yeah okay that sounds good so we're going to get rid of all that stuff around the edges i think i would get rid of the date the date's not helping us so let's get rid of everything. Certainly the no thing, we're going to get rid of that because that's come scrolling in and that will pull our eye as soon as anything moves on a slide. Now it's okay as long as we're learning something from that movement. Otherwise, no. No animated transitions, no animations. So as a, as a driving past at 70 miles an hour, what we're wanting to do is to look for that pathology. So anything that will reduce that noise around the edges, yeah, the the uh, the better that would be. All right, are you staying with me then, uh, yes. Gregor's to show? Yes, to I am. One. Right, we'll look at the next one then. I'm going to show. This is another. This is another animated one actually, real as well. Oh, oh. crikey, Charlie. Okay, so imagine that I am the person who's very proudly shown that. And let's have a go at some good feedback skills as well. So how would you handle feedback with me afterwards? When I've shown that slide, I'm feeling very, very proud of, uh, at best of the best um, at, uh, at the BOA. Oh dear. Um, firstly, um we have a um, background of the um, wound or a granulate, granulating tissue on the, on the human body, uh, which is not particularly well edited. So I would probably edit the picture better and put it in the side of the slide if we, if we really have to be on that slide. And secondly, the, the table that you are presenting is uh, containing too much data and um, we don't know how this uh, is relating to the to the um, to the background picture. We know this is a cross tabulation of inter observer outcome for each group, as the title says. Um, but the font and the amount of data is illegible. Yeah, it is. So there's a few problems here, aren't there? First of all, the image in the background is 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 uh, is quite arresting that's the thing that we're looking at and, and looking through these numbers here which have got a whole load of little tiddly bits of writing not very high contrast because it's on skin and then 
it's all wrapped around up here. So it's very difficult to get a handle on what this is. And it, it's, it's too much actually. Can any, I don't, what's this saying? I hope this isn't a slide belonging to anyone here. I can, that's <laughs> a nasty thought. Anybody know what this is saying? The words are cut off. Yeah, you're right about that. And a very, very big table. Yeah. OK, so we don't we, we so if we can't if we spend a few seconds looking at it and we still don't get it, it's we certainly can't drive past it at 70 miles an hour. So. Pictures in the background with stuff over the top. No. As a general rule, numbers in tables. No. no. Display them visually somehow joe's saying there's no point in the table being there no there really there really isn't if we're standing up and making a presentation the trick is to transform not to pass information across right so the stuff that might go in the jbjs or in a great big long paper that's fine people can go and look at that later but if we're making a presentation mm -mm not numbers all over the place and drive past at, at uh, 70 miles an hour and, and get the picture. Yeah, Nisha, the picture is so distracting that I've lost interest in the data. Yeah, me too. And, and actually everyone has, because there's a bit of the, the fire hose is going in their face and people just turn away and think about something else because it's just over facing. Right, we have got one more. I think let's have a look at this this is a this is a better one now these are saying the same thing you know but the bottom one is better than the top one so the the top one's obviously no good now let us make this bottom one even better who's coming out of obscurity to make that even better with me Rupert, keep an eye out for hands. Who's coming out to be with me? Yeah, I don't know if uh, Ola de Pupu can unmute if they want to comment. Otherwise, we don't have new hands at the moment. Well, we'll make do with Carlos. We'll make do, we'll make do amend. Carlos, you've got your hand up, so we're going to use you. Thank you. Right, so Ken would say, make it larger. Yeah, okay, let's make that larger. Let, yeah, that flags instead of countries' names. Oh, I like that, that's, yeah. Okay, that's a good idea, Hugo. Flags instead of country names. Wherever you can, if you can replace bits of text with a picture, fantastic. All right, anything else we do to make that even better? Put it in the chat. Shorter title and in type of... Oh, OK. So how would you, Andre, how would you put a question? How would you make that a question? Remove speech marks, definitely. Victoria, no question. Chopsticks point to Japan. Oh, OK. Yeah, good thinking. Good thinking. And we can certainly take those speech marks out. Now, what's that down there? It's some funny little thing. I think it might even say Facebook. I can't see it. Facebook 2007. Do you know what? It's not helping us. And are you often, I often see them on your slides, little citations at the bottom of slides. Don't, because nobody can see them. People panic and go, oh my gosh, I've got to write it down. Oh, and they get halfway through and then they're not listening to what you're saying. So don't give them a list at the end. And actually, the really trendy thing to do now is to give them a QR code that takes them straight to a list. So all they have to do is to point their camera up at the screen, take a picture, and it takes them straight to your document on with the uh, a whole a whole list of the references. So you're not trying to squeeze them on there. Right. Yes. Titles should be levels of obesity by country. Sounds good to me. So do you see that with some real analysis and with some real, um, real polish, 
you can improve your slides. So the slides that I've shown you tonight, I know to, when we finished, I'll go back over them because there are things I'm not happy with and I don't like. And I'll do that now. I won't wait until the next time I'm talking about presentations. And these I've already polished a month ago, a week ago, and last night. So I'm constantly going over my slides and making them as good as I possibly as I possibly can. And every time I'll see something, I think, no, that's not necessary, and I can polish up with that. Okay, let us carry on. Now, the um, let's have a look at this. What would you do with this? Put it in the chat. What would you do to make that better? Remember what I said, contrast, yeah, contrast. Remember what I said, if we're looking at an X-ray and you all show X-rays, we're wanting to look right at the pathology. So we could do arrows to the pathology, or if we're wanting to get people really involved, we could say, what can you see? But we want them to be looking at what where, where we're wanting them to see. So actually at the moment, people are going to the edge of the slide, then to the edge of the X-ray and then in. So as a general rule, we're better putting our X-rays on a black background. Well done, Gilberto, Medina, very good. Put them on a black background and then people go straight to see what they're needing to see. Right, like that. Thank you slides, which are very popular throughout the world with images that are often irrelevant and the words thank you written on them. And I asked presenters why they say, well, it's so people know it's the end. When you create your point B, your final closure, that needs to be really powerful. That's your call to action. And that's what the audience are going to go away doing. So don't dilute it by showing an irrelevant picture and writing thank you. You can say a quiet thank you, step away from the lectern, but leave people with that final summary slide that calls them to action. What do you think about this slide? Right, have a look at that. This is really important. That's breaking a load of rules, isn't it? Way too many words, so way too many words. Way more than five eye sweeps per slide. We certainly can't get, get the message driving past it at 70 miles an hour. And it's just too opaque. Right, let's carry on. One of the presentation slides used to assess the space worthiness of the 2003 Columbia Space Shuttle. This key slide offers a reassuring assessment of the condition of the Columbia while subsequent bullet points undermine that lead message. The vaguely quantitative words like significant and significantly are used five times on this slide, with de facto meanings ranging from detectable in largely irrelevant calibration case study to an amount of damage so that everyone dies to a difference of 640 fold. None of these five usages appears to refer to the technical meaning of statistical significance. The title's reassuring and the meaning is left to the reader. But the Columbia Accident Investigation Board said, it is easy to understand how a senior manager might read this PowerPoint slide and not realise that it addresses a life-threatening situation. So, this really was life or death. So what about delivery? Again, this is just about practice and focusing on the audience. Face forward. 
keep your eye on the audience you can see here that i've got a madonna mic on i did feel a bit silly but when i got to the venue the audiovisual people said i'm sorry we haven't got a madonna mic actually when i really pressed them and did a bit of begging they did and that made me much freer to be able to engage with the audience and avoid habits the self-touching, the self-soothing, the jangling in your pockets, the umming and ahhing. And the way to check your habits is to video yourself and be very analytical. The really important thing about this is you cannot just turn up with your memory stick and then hope it's all going to work out. For me, I absolutely always get to wherever I'm going at least an hour early to make sure everything works, to make friends with the audiovisual people. So there is never a time where I'm standing on a stage somewhere looking irritated and going, I don't look, can somebody sort out my slides? I've always got a plan B. Even if everything goes horribly wrong, I will just gracefully go, hmm, okay. The slides aren't there then I will just have to do it myself if I've not got a flip chart I'll have to find another way of trying to convey my message but I always always have a plan b and I don't leave anything to chance I will make friends with the visual aid people and that's why I always have a Madonna mic because they will always find me one you can see here, I am so nervous. I am so nervous. I can remember the feeling. But looking at me, I don't look it. I look as though I'm in the zone and I'm doing my job. But I keep my eyes on the audience every second. I might allow myself one of these just to check that my slide's up there, but I don't speak. So I'll... Mm, it's there and then I will carry on speaking. I do not speak unless I've got my eyes on the audience and I make, even if I can't see them. I was in a completely dark auditorium somewhere else in the world. Again, desperately nervous, about 500 people there. I couldn't see anyone. So I couldn't see if they were looking bored or irritated or just couldn't see anything. But I just looked out four or five seconds in different places around the auditorium. So it looked as though I was making eye contact and like a, a good masseur, a good masseur never takes their hands off you. A good presenter doesn't take their eyes off the audience. So keep those eyes on the audience. Keep facing forwards. Keep your hand gestures out. Don't Keep your hands away. Don't worry too much about them being over the top. The worst thing is to have them either in the fig leaf or hidden in your pockets. And there's something about movement when you're rehearsing that will help you remember what you wanted to say. There's something about the link between gestures, words and how your mind thinks that all links together and helps you remember the things that you wanted to say. So watch your uh, eye contact and your facing forwards all the time. Now, what about voices? Modulation, modulation. Somebody, Ken has said monotonous. I hope, Ken, you're not saying that I am being monotonous because I really work hard at making sure that my voice goes up and down and then my modulation is good. My husband is downstairs and he'll be listening to me and I know we'll be thinking she just sounds weird because it doesn't sound like me. It's all a little bit magnified when I'm presenting. So my modulation, I'm watching my pace. Accents matter not a jot. Never worry about accents as long as you can be understood. That's our job to be understood and to engage with the audience. We are not making a Shakespearean performance. And if we impress people while we're doing something, that's fantastic, but that's not our job. And looking at the reasons you all make presentations, a lot of that is about education. A lot of that is about changing practice. 
that's really, really important, much more important than whether people think you're cool or not. So voice, that's just about practice, modulation, accents, don't worry about it. Eye contact, we've said, is absolutely crucial. And I'll say to you again, making good presentations is just about practice. It is a learned skill. Um, I work some of the time, or I did do, with people with severe learning disabilities who, who, who can't read and write, but they can make fabulous presentations and they learn to do it in just a morning. It is a learned skill. It is not a natural God-given talent and don't for one second think it is. It is a learned skill that just requires practice. But our presentations are not about purveying information. They're not about telling people what to think or do. They're about transforming people. And if we can focus on whoever is in our audience, whether we're trying to persuade, educate, inform, get people with us, we want them to go away better and safer because of their time with us. Our job is not to tell them everything we know in one of those fire hoses. Right, any questions before we conclude? Uh, Lisa, there is a question on the Q and A. It right. says, uh, "says when delivering virtual presentation, there seem to be encouragement on ensuring you have a plain white background in your setting. It seems too clinical, impersonal. Is this necessary?" Right. Okay. Interesting. You mean like at here? This no, set. I, I, th I think it means a white back. I, I, I think that's, that's what it means. Yes. Yes. It's Anonymous attendee, can you tell us yeah. whether you mean the background, <laughs> your virtual background here or in your slide? Sl Interestingly, slides, if you are, if they are absolutely white, that gives some people a problem. Really stark white backgrounds. You're better going for something with um, a little bit of cream in it. So it's off white on your slides. In terms of being given templates, just watch that. You know, some organizations, and I, I won't I won't say which ones, but some organizations really like you to use a template with their logo on it. I'm sure they do. But unless you're being paid a lot of money by them, your job is not to market for them. If they're really desperate, I will put things on the first slide and then that is it. Because logos drag your eye to the logo every time the slide changes, which is great marketing, but that is very, very rarely your job. Your job is to light a fire and help people go away better and safer. So ditch the logos. As for background here, and I've done quite a lot about this recently because I'm just about to do something with those getting ready for ST3 interviews. Um, so background, probably does matter and I've changed it. I've had it plain for the last two years. So there's just wood and wall. And then I put this up because there's some discussion about having some, a little bit of something in the background, but certainly nothing that's going to be distracting. And actually after we finish today, I'm gonna have to fiddle with my lighting because it's too much because, oh, that's better now. I've got a ring light here and that's much better. You can't see the shadow that I've got from the, the lamp that I put from the other side. So it's, it's worth thinking about that. Yes, sorry, you did mean actual room background. I never blur. Blurring doesn't really work because as soon as you start moving backwards and forwards, you disengage with the audience because you disappear. So no blurring, just a fairly plainish background with a little bit of something in it. I'm going to move my Coke out of the way there, Coca-Cola. Um, and, and yeah, just be mindful about how it looks and your eyes need to be about a third of the way down the screen. So I could probably just adjust that a little bit a third of the way down 
And also what you wear matters. What you've got to be careful of is that you don't, what you wear doesn't blur you into the background. So you're looking like a, a talking head. Um, and usually block, plain color is better than a uh, heavy pattern. How far you sit from the camera? Well, you can see that my camera is up. So my camera is higher than my eyes. And if I'm working with a laptop, I put it on books. So my camera is higher than my eyes and I'm looking up and I need to make sure that you can see my face, and my torso and my hand gestures. So that's probably about right. Okay, any other questions? Got two more minutes. You saw a comment there in the uh, chat from Theophilus that, that trusts often have a template with a logo and a white background that they do want you to use. And I'm sure they do, I'm sure they do. I'm sure and people, I would say a lot of the things I do, people say we want, they'll send me templates for me to use and I just ignore it. Nobody's going to, uh, I don't think they're going to sack you for that, are they? <laughs> so no, they get in the way, they distract um, and they can ask away, but you are, your job is not to market your trust, your specialist society, the commercial partners you work with. So logos are a no-no as far as I'm concerned. So that's it from me. It is about lighting a fire. Your presentations are about lighting a fire. They're about people going away thoughtful, going to do something that's really, really important, not just going away saying, oh, do you know, Roots, really cool. Or Carlos makes a lovely presentation. No, they need to be going away really focused on what you're trying to light a fire with, and you're moving them from A to B. So work out what B is and work out where people are in terms of A. Thanks very much for having me. <laughs>